to give a basic uh, introduction here. Um, I apologize if you know this, but this is how we produce electricity. It's the same, really, as any other steam producing power plant. We heat water, we boil it, we heat it, make steam, turn a turbine, the turbine turns a generator, and the generator puts out electricity over the grid into your homes and businesses. The difference between a nuclear power plant is the way we heat the water. We don't burn coal and we don't burn gas. We, 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 we create nuclear fission. We split atoms. And that happens in the reactor vessel there on the left-hand side of the page. It's a contained metal vessel that sits inside a containment, a double containment structure. And I'll show you how, how robust those structures are in a minute so that the radiation is contained in the fuel rod in the first instance, in the vessel in the second, in the containment in the third. And that's where it's supposed to stay, and that's where we like to stay, and that's where it usually stays, and that's, the, and that's the safety element of nuclear power. The condenser here is where the steam condenses after it goes through the turbine, and it does so by having cooler water in the fuel. And that's where nuclear power uh, plants use water. They don't really consume it as much as the water goes through and recirculates, but we have to have a supply of water to cool the, in the condenser to cool the steam off. So when you hear about water consumption for our plant here in Victoria, we're going to obtain water from the Guadalupe um, River. We're working with GBRA, and we, we estimate now a significant amount of water, about 75,000 acre feet per year to be conserved. We'll probably, the plant will probably actually use in a given year more like 55,000 or some numbers around there. And it's going to be dependent on the climate and on the rainfall and those kinds of things. So when we're talking about the water use, that's, that's the primary water use, coming through the loop to cool the condenser. Our plans call for us to have a 48, approximately 45, maybe 100 acre cooling pond on the McCann property that will store the water that's diverted from the river, and it'll store that water, and that water will loop through the system and continuously cool. And as that water evaporates, we'll have to bring water back in from the Guadalupe to replenish it or make it up. And sometimes we'll send water back to the Guadalupe to keep the chemistry and everything, right? But all that's permitted, and it's all environmentally safe and acceptable. GBRA and our own experts tell us there is ample surface water to do this process. That is going to be a subject of debate Maybe not so much on the volume, but on what's the impact of taking that water to the community, both upstream, both downstream. And that's something that'll be in our, our COLA that we file. There are people here who have a strong interest in that, and we'll have that public open debate about water. It's ultimately not, it's a community decision. You all have to decide that you have a water resource here that can be put to use in different ways, and you all as a community have to decide, is this a legitimate, economically beneficial way to use a resource that God gave us here in Victoria County. And, and that's just the whole sum game of it. So understand this issue because it's an important issue and let's talk through it. But all of the science so far indicates that there's more than enough water to do this and that we can do it in an environmentally conscious and environmentally friendly way. We also will use some groundwater during construction for potable water, for sanitary, for fire protection. We're working with the groundwater district, uh, Tim and his team, and it's about a thousand acre feet per year um, during operations, a little bit more than that during construction. So let's talk about radiation for the of the year. Everybody's exposed uh, to radiation, and I get asked a lot, is this safe? Is it safe to be in your nuclear plant? And, and safe means no risk, okay? So we have to watch our terminology here. Because there's risk in everything we do. Is it safe to ride a bicycle? I would say yes. If you've ever been in a bike accident without a helmet on, you might have a different view of what safety means in that regard. So I'm going to talk about the risk and put it in those terms, to put it in perspective relative to other risks, other radiation risks that you get every day. So we talk about measuring radiation in rem or millirem. A millirem is one one thousandth of a rem. Don't ask me to get into why it's called that, but, but just take my word that that's how you measure it. That's the unit. Everywhere around us is radiation, and I've got some bar graph here that gives you an idea of the dose, which means how much radiation your body absorbs that you would get from common activities. So let's just say you're out walking around on Earth, living your life um, as a normal human being in America. You will get about 300 millirem of radiation dose per year mostly from the sun. There's some left over from atomic bomb testing way 
back when some of the materials that we build buildings with, like granite and limestone, contain radioactive elements. So if you go to the Hallowed Halls of Congress, you're actually going to get some dose walking around the Capitol because the stone contains some. When I flew down here last night, actually yesterday, when the sun was still shining, I got about five milligrams, maybe a little less, but a cross-country flight in an airplane at 40,000 feet, you get about five milligrams of radiation. If you drink one eight-ounce glass of orange juice every day for a year, there's potassium in the orange juice. And some of that potassium is called potassium-40. It's a radioactive isotope of potassium that you ingest when you drink orange juice. One eight-ounce glass of orange juice a day for a year, and your body receives a dose of about two and a half milligrams. If you live within 50 miles of a coal-fired power plant, which actually puts out radiation, for one year, you will get a dose of approximately 0.03 milligram. The same statistic for living within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant over the course of one year, you get three times less than that, 0.009 milligram. If you choose to smoke, and I don't want to offend anybody, but if you choose to smoke, one pack a day for a year, 2,000 milligram of radiation. It's all the same radiation. It affects your body, sometimes in different ways, depending on the you know, the organs that it gives. But it's radiation, ladies and gentlemen. And what I'm telling you is that living near a nuclear power plant, and there's a lot of science to back it up, is no more risky in terms of radiation than not living near a nuclear power plant. Now people say, well, yeah, but what if there's an accident? TMI. We actually own the Three Mile Island Unit 1, but Unit 2 was the one where there was the accident in 1979. The president put a commission together, and they did a hypothetical of the, of the radiation release from TMI, you know, one in the accident. A person who stood at the gate, at the, at the property line at the gate, for 10 days, around the clock, and ate food grown on the ground right next to there, and ate fish from the Susquehanna River, for 10 days would have received 100 milligrams. That's less than you receive in a year. It's a small number. People don't understand that what, we, what is called the worst accident in U.S. history, you would have gotten, and that's a hypothetical, 100 milligrams, okay?